What's up friends, my name's Tall and I'm your host on the Dinosaur Channel for all things dinosaur and prehistoric. Today we're launching a new series on the Dinosaur Channel called A Conversation With, and today I have the honor of sitting down with the lead paleontologist from the Tanis site in North Dakota. To give you a little insight before we start the interview, Tanis is a site in North Dakota that recently was covered on a BBC documentary called Dinosaurs The Final Day. The documentary joins Robert De Palma and David Attenborough to explore this incredible site and tell the story of the dinosaurs last day on Earth. So let's get right into the interview. We're here to talk about Roswell. Well, New Mexico, right? Exactly. The aliens built the pyramids. Yep. Wow, I am nervous. Hold on, let me uh, calm the nerves. First time doing an interview like this. It's cool. All right, nice I, to meet I'm you. I'm nervous. You're making me nervous. <laughs> You're making me nervous. We're gonna make I'm each other nervous. nervous in this conversation. Excellent. That's good. I'm joined by. The famous Robert De Palma here in the Museum of Natural History in Palm Beach. We're going to be talking today about a lot of amazing things when it comes to the world of paleontology and dinosaurs, but I wanted you to introduce yourself real quick to my audience and tell us about yourself. Well, I'm Robert De Palma. I am an adjunct professor of geosciences at Florida Atlantic University. I am a postgraduate researcher at the University of Manchester, UK. I'm also <laughs> emeritus curator of paleontology here at the Palm Beach Museum of Natural History. So how did you get started here in Palm Beach? I know you're a Florida native, but tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the Palm Beach Museum. I was born down here, and ever since I was old enough to know that that rock on the ground was actually a fossil, I've been intrigued with fossils. So I've been digging up fossils and bones since I was a kid. I love this stuff. It's really interesting. So I got involved in different school programs and different organizations down here. Back when I was in middle school and high school, I was involved with the old Graves Museum down in uh, Dania, and prepping dinosaur bones, going on expeditions with them. And that sort of led to a natural progression of things. And do you, this is a fun fact, this is something that I, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about. That Graves Museum, that was like my childhood spot. I did my, I think my fourth or fifth birthday there. No way, you I went there? I used to go there all the time as a kid, me and my whole friend group. We used to do the little geode cutting. The, yeah, yeah. It was like my favorite place. I have pictures of myself as a kid there all the time. And whenever I drive by now, because I live down there, I see the uh, dinosaur statue they have on, I think it's on Sheridan or Dania Beach Boulevard, on US 1. Yeah. Uh, I, I always get nostalgic and think about it. So coming here and meeting you and Rudy and knowing that you guys had an involvement in that is so cool for me. My friend Larry Williams did that skeleton. It's really amazing. But when you were there doing your birthday party, I was upstairs in the lab in the shadows like Gollum from Lord of the Rings <laughs> working on the fossils with my friend Terry. We were the That's only two so people cool. working on fossils up there. That's so you were, you were doing the birthday and we were upstairs hidden away you know, working on that stuff back when we were in high school. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh man, that is so fun. So we're, we're going to open up with something that I think in the popular culture and in the media, I want to obviously talk to you about tennis. I want to talk to you about all the amazing discoveries that you made recently. And uh, we're going to get into that. But we have to open up just to sort of break the ice and clear the air a little bit. How do you feel about Jurassic Park as a, as a movie series as a whole? Oh my goodness. I think I, I have a biased opinion about Jurassic Park. Okay. I love Jurassic Park. Amazing. I grew up with it. It's Amazing. awesome. My really good friend John Gurchy helped design the Raptors for Jurassic Park. Oh wow. Uh, so I've had various different people involved in the, the making of the movie. Stan Winston, who did the dinos, right. he helped me out back when I was in high school when I started sculpting dinos. No way. And he gave me like pointers on how to do it. So all the people that were involved with that uh, movie that that I knew personally, amazing people. But, um, you know, one thing that I kind of would like to say about Jurassic Park, so many of the paleo enthusiasts are so quick to say, oh, well, that's not accurate, or this is not accurate, or this uh, thing should be changed. And it's like, dude, it's a movie. Right. These are not meant to be accurate. Th these are actually like movie creatures, and it's supposed to be enjoyed as sort of a fictional kind of a thing. So just enjoy it, man. Don't get all uptight about it. Yeah, I think there's there's been this huge uh, push recently that I've noticed as I've been growing up, you know, I grew up with Jurassic Park as a movie, of this real aggressiveness towards the movie. And I think something that a lot of people don't realize is like, for a lot of us, we sort of grew up inspired by this movie and it brings us into, and I know that it's turned a lot of uh, kids into paleontologists, especially coming, coming of age now, so. Jurassic Park is meant to be something to be enjoyed. Right. It's meant to be a positive experience, inspirational. It's not meant to cause all this sort of anguish with people and, you know, fights among buddies. Just enjoy it. Be inspired by it. Like you said, yeah. it actually helped people get into paleo and stuff. So if it's treated as something that's just a fun experience, then that's all you need, man. That's all you need. Yeah. You're right. Okay, let's talk about tennis. I, wanna, I, I want you to introduce my audience to tennis because I'm sure that many, many people, if they do know about tennis, they probably don't know it by name and they don't know exactly what it is. So could you give us a little you know, background on what tennis is? Well, first, uh, the reason tennis is named tennis, which most people don't know, 
is it's actually named after a real town in ancient Egypt. So okay. this is an archaeological site, and there's a reason for that. Um, the original Tanis in Egypt was where they found a very important artifact, and combined with the Rosetta Stone, that artifact enabled the full deciphering of the hieroglyphic language. So it was key. If it was only the Rosetta Stone, we would never have fully deciphered hieroglyphics. So the site named Tanis in North Dakota uh, was instrumental in something else, and I thought that because it offered so many clues to the paleo world, it would be kind of like a cool homage to the Egyptian uh, discovery wow. to name it that because I'm a sentimental kind of guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you actually had a hand in naming Tanis Tanis. I named it Tanis. That, that was I it. named it Tanis. Yes. I did. Wow, yeah. that's so cool. So, what is that? What is all the information that we're talking about? I right. said there's information there, and I haven't said what. Um, basically, you like dinosaurs. Love. I them. like dinosaurs. Yeah. Lots of people like dinosaurs. What made them die up? What was the big thing at the end of the Cretaceous that brought it down? and made them die. What every Joe Schmo knows is the KT extinction, right? And now we call it the KPG extinction, although I like to still call it KT. Right. So do the experts, that's the big secret. They don't like calling it KPG either. <laughs> but it's the big asteroid impact. Right. You've got a massive asteroid the size of Mount Everest, came down at 20 kilometers a second, and push come to shove, fast forward a little bit, and it caused one of the most massive extinctions in Earth's history. 75% of life on Earth, not just the dinosaurs. So. When I say fast forward to that end, that's mostly what we have to do when looking at science because we know the long-term trends, what happened as a result of that impact, hundreds, thousands, millions of years in the future. But there's sort of a gap in our knowledge. What happened right after impact, minute to hour scale, and we really don't know that well. That's where the site comes into play. The Tanis site preserves the first moments after impact in essentially a minute by minute film reel a geological equivalent of high-speed film. And it gives us a window into probably the worst moment in the Cretaceous. Yeah, that was a really bad day for the dinosaurs, huh? That was such a bad day. But so, it would've been so cool to be there. And you're, you're featured now in this new documentary with uh, David Attenborough called Dinosaurs The Last Day, right? And this, I just had a chance to watch this documentary. It's absolutely incredible. It really goes through piece by piece exactly that last day, and it highlights certain dinosaurs and certain creatures that you guys dug up in Tanis, um, and it sort of gives us an insight on what their last moments of life were like. And that's really, really incredible. Um, what I'm curious about on, in, on your side is, like, what was it like working on a documentary like this, specifically with a person like David Attenborough? I, I'm so glad you asked, because I was going to first dive into that, whether you wanted to or not. <laughs> and I want, so. Dude, I wanted to, for sure. So, basically, they tell you you should never, ever meet your heroes, because you'll be disappointed. Okay. And that was not the case at all with Sir David. Um, when I met Sir David, he was just as enthusiastic and genuine as he is on camera. And he truly cares about the world's ecologies and life on Earth. He truly cares about the current environmental crisis. And he's an amazing person. He's absolutely inspirational. I got goosebumps being next to him because you can tell he cares about the world and he cares about where it's going. He told me that because of how this project relates to all of our modern ecological situations, that this is one of the most significant paleo-related projects because it not only tells us about the paleo world, but it directly relates to what's going on right now. And that is what moved him. And it moved him, which moved me. It, it, he's an amazing guy. Wow. And that, that's, I mean, that's really incredible. He's such a, you know, he's such a, a figure and icon in this world of conservation and science and stuff. So. Like being able to work next to him in, in, in the documentary of this scale, that's really, I mean, you guys are telling a story that's giving honor to these creatures that existed so long ago. And not only that, you're really giving the world an insight on what happened here. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. Tal, think about it. I mean, since you and I have been alive, our entire lives, he has been the word right. in natural history and the natural world and everything else. He's the word in that, in conservation. And that is, you know, it's a powerful thing when you look back in time and relate that to today. Um, as he mentioned, and I mentioned a few other times, the work at Tanis, which basically puts together the first hours, we're, we're, we're looking at maximum the first two hours after impact. When we're putting together the story based on all of that, we are given an opportunity to look back in time in that window and understand what happened during that missing gap, what led up to all those long-term things and the impact. And that's our way of understanding, well, 
how does Earth's biota respond to global scale hazards? That's the key. Right. This is not just a paleo nerd, wow, we know what happened in the Cretaceous. Because when you look at mass extinction events, most of the world's mass extinction events occurred over thousands to millions of years. Not the KPG extinction. That happened much more rapidly. Startlingly close to the time scales we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. So how do we know how the world is going to respond to what's going on right now? How do we know what we can help, or if we can, when we look at the, the prehistoric world? That's our window. We're basically going back in time to project that to what's happening now. And that's the central key. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting that you bring up that point, because this is not even something I wanted to talk about, but it's something I'm really passionate about. As You know, I consider myself a paleo enthusiast. I'm not educated in the factor, but I learned all the stuff I know online and just having a fascination for paleontology. But, you know, I, when I tell people that I love dinosaurs, that I love paleontology, I get flack from some people who are like, this is a stupid field. This field doesn't matter. It doesn't teach us anything. It's in the past. We should focus on the future. But something that a lot of people don't understand is that when you dig into the past, we learn about what could happen in the future. And we Absolutely. project and we can figure out maybe what will happen to us. No, you're, you, you hit the nail on the head. I'm so glad that, you know, you and other people actually get that because yeah. this is not a simulation. This is not something that we're like, oh, well, you know, we've got a hypothesis about this. This is actually looking back in time and piecing it together right. based on observing. So that's the cool part about it. Now, when we actually talk about specifics, <laughs> we know that the asteroid came down about 3,000 miles from Tanis, right. down the Yucatan Peninsula. But when I'm sitting there in North Dakota and I'm looking at the rock column and I see all these animals, fish and plants and animals and logs and, and everything else, all like tossed in there together. And then above that, I'll see a little lens of these little spherical objects called ejecta spherules blasted out of the crater. And then at the very top of the site, there's this band of what we call KPG boundary clay. It's that dust-sized fallout that came out over the months to years after impact. That's the story unfolding, and I'm like, my God, those ejected spherules were coming out of the sky 66 billion years ago. They were glowing coming out of the sky. There's raining you know, uh, glass beads coming out of the sky. And the last time they saw the light of day was the worst day of the Cretaceous. And here we are digging these things up. How cool is that? It's, that, it's, it's incredible. a moving experience. I remember seeing in the documentary, and this is something I wanted to get into. I'm so happy that you brought this up. It's, you know, when you when you first pull those out and you start seeing things like the uh, the um, the skin on the dinosaur's leg, and you saw the triceratops skin, I see this childhood excitement, this sort of like naive childhood wonder that comes out in your eyes. Like you really get excited, and you're sort of you're almost yelling. You know, um, is this something that happens to you frequently on digs when you're out there? Or is it something that's reserved for these special, like, Thessalosaur uh, finds? We can't help it. Um, I'm speaking for the rest of my team as well. We're passionate about this. Right. We don't do it because it's comfortable. We don't do it because, you know, we're, we're there for, you know, the, the glory of it. It's because we've got a passion for it. You know, you've got hot temperatures, you've got freezing temperatures, you've got rain, you've got wind, you've got, you know, biting insects, all that stuff. You don't do it because you're comfortable doing it. But for those moments where you get to be there for the discovery of things that no one's ever seen before and all these different aspects of the prehistoric world that you're able to see them kind of piece together in front of you, those are the moments. The excitement's genuine and it, we all think this, it is uh, an honor to be there for those moments because that's what it's happening. Right. So no, that's all genuine and it happens all the time from the skin, to the leg, to the little objective spirals in the outcrop. I did not know at first that that was a KPG boundary site. I had no idea it had anything to do with the impact. The people that were there before me had no idea. Uh, Rob Sula and Steve Nicholas, uh, uh, wonderful people who run the, uh, the group called Paleo Prospectors, they found the site years ago. Uh, they tipped me off about it. They said, look, we know you're studying this sort of stuff. Come check the site out. This might be a project you want to take on. And I said, well, yes, I'd love to. Um, all they knew was that there were fish there. And that was, even if the site had nothing to do with the impact, the fish made it really important. Right. Those were, in, in one single plaster jacket, there were more fish articulated in the rock than anywhere else in the Hell Creek Formation. Wow. So I knew that the depositional scenario was special. It was conducive to that kind of preservation. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, and, and thank God that they had done that work because if they hadn't found those fish, we would have no idea that the site even existed. 
experts were working in the, year, the area for many, many years, and they never even noticed the fish. So if they hadn't spotted them, we'd be in trouble. But going in and looking at those fish, and then noticing, well, what's that weird debris up there? It's like spherical objects. That's kind of peculiar. I didn't jump to conclusions. I just noted in my head, all right, let's put that down in the notes. We've got this weird spherical you know, object there and a bunch more. Okay, fine. And then you notice, okay, stratigraphically, we're close to the KT boundary. Sorry, KPG boundary. We don't want to <laughs> upset the nerds. Um, so we're really close. That's cool. Um, then we do geochemical testing on the spherules, mm -hmm. and they match ejecta from the impact. The shape matches ejecta from the impact. Oh, well, now we got something. They started off as glass. Most of them turned to clay over time, but some had original pieces of glass that didn't completely alter. We tested that as well. Not only did we geochemically test it, but we radiometrically dated the glass. It came up as the same date as the impact. Oh, now you're really into something. And then looking above the site, um, you know, Rob and Steve were almost there because they actually dug through this layer to get to the fish. So they, they just were there. They almost had the story. Right above the site, capping the whole thing, is the KPG boundary clay, like it's preserved elsewhere in the United States. The beautiful line of peach-colored clay that's the fallout. Like, okay, it's packed with shocked quartz and all this impact-related stuff. And then I start seeing marine fossils in there, ammonite shells right. and marine fish and shark teeth and things like that. I'm like, oh, man, this is one hell of a story. And it just kept building and building and building. And each piece added to what that story was. It was absolutely phenomenal. Can you, can you, you remember sort of your feelings when you first arrived in tennis? Did you have any idea like what was under there? Could you imagine that something like this no, could have existed? No, that's just the thing. You never know what's there. Right. So the only thing that I knew when I first got there and they, they first passed the project on to me is that there were fish. And I was excited. I was over the moon excited. Wow, there's really cool fish, really great preservation. This is going to be a great project. And then we find asteroid impact debris. We didn't know which impact yet. Right. Okay, there's impact debris. Cool, there was an impact associated with this. And then we work out which impact it was. I'm like, holy God, we've got the Chichilu impact. And then the flow structures. Uh, in the rock and the position of the fish, we noticed that there was a massive surge that went inland and then went back out again. It sloshed two main times. And I'm like, this is a tsunami-like surge. It has marine fossils and everything. How cool, we've got a tsunami-like surge at the impact. And then we had the, the layer of uh, KPG powdery clay above, like, so this basically is an ejecta-bearing deposit locked in time that's then capped by the fine grain debris. That is locked right there. That was deposited only during the period of coarse ejecta accretion. Walter Alvarez himself, Walter Alvarez, the guy who was part of the study, performed the calculations, figuring out the timing of the site. And so it's so incredible that that in the fossil record, this stuff actually translates, that it actually preserves, that you could study this stuff. But obviously, you need somebody like you. I see you sort of like the, uh, the person putting together the puzzle. You know, you're piecing everything from above, sort of collecting all these pieces of history and paleontology that are coming together to put together a picture for us. And that's what we see in this documentary, um, really showcasing these last moments. So within the documentary, you guys showcase so many incredible finds. Like I, I was talking to you about this briefly before we started uh, the interview. But uh, I was shocked by the biodiversity. It's like really like taking a look into like a wildlife park millions of years ago. You have a turtle that was uh, impaled by a stick. You have a baby pterosaur egg, you ha or an embryo right inside of a, an egg. And then you have a Thessalosaurus leg. You have Triceratops skin. What other things do you foresee? If you had to take your wildest guess, just off based off the animals that used to live there, what do you sort of foresee you potentially finding in the future? Well, I'll answer the first question first. Okay. Um, as far as the biodiversity there, yeah, we're blown away. Yeah. Because the Hell Creek has been studied for a long time, but preservation at the site is so good, we're able to get a signal for things you don't usually see. And that signal is one of thriving life. We're seeing a bustling community at the end of the Cretaceous. So this was not one that was already in decline. We're seeing animals and plants all over the place. Right. And we're actually seeing evidence of baby dinosaurs as well in the trackways at the site. Wow. So we've got fossils at that site. Uh, of animals and plants that died just before impact and then on the day of impact. So the fish and the plants and everything, those all died on the day of impact. Triceratops died before, probably weeks to months because it hadn't completely decayed. Right. Thessalosaur, as a scientist, I can't say 100%. We know it died on the day of impact. You just can't say that. But what we can say 
is it is compatible with an animal that died on the day of impact. And if it died before impact, we're talking maybe days to weeks before impact at most, mm -hmm. based on the preservation of that piece. So what that tells us is we've got a very good view of what was there right up to impact, you know, right up to that point in time. And the beauty of that is we've got a picture of this thriving ecosystem, this thriving biome in that area at the end. And thinking further, you know, I'm about to go out there in a, a few weeks on another expedition. We have to meet people from the American Museum out there. And people are always asking me, are you excited to go out there? What are you going to find? I'm like, first, I'm damn excited to be out there. <laughs> I'm, awesome. I'm excited because I know that we're going to find something incredible, noteworthy, and that will blow your mind. I'm like, well, what is it? What are you going to find? I've got no idea. All I know is that for the past 10 years, every single year, I've been out there and other teams have been out there, and every single year we come back with, oh my God, guess what we found? What does this mean for the whole story? This is incredible. But we didn't know what that would be when we first went out. So all I can tell you is based on past experience, we're going to come back with amazing stuff, amazing stories, and data that is just going to be game changing. I love it. That's so exciting. Okay, but I, I have to I have to harker on it a little bit. Uh -oh. Don't tell me like what you expect to find or what you think you'd find. But now, as a personal question, what would you hope to find? Like, if you had to take a guess, you know, or not even a guess, but something that comes from your heart, what would you hope to discover there? Illumination. No, sorry, that was a Sean Connery uh, <laughs> reference. Um, what I hope to find is all the little details in between. I want to find more dinosaur uh, material there mm -hmm. because that is giving us an idea of what the dinosaurs were like at that time. The Thessalosaur leg, we've got scale patterns that we didn't know existed for Thessalosaurs. We're able to get a better idea of what they looked like. But the baby dinosaurs, we've gotten trackways from juvenile hadrosaurs and probably juvenile ceratopsians as well, four toe footprints. Really? That's and incredible. That's right under the surge. Wow. So basically you had this surge, an inland directed surge. It, it washed up this river valley, right? So you had a river that, that carved really deeply into the Elk Creek. It emptied into the Western Interior Seaway, which at that time cut the U.S. in two. Right. And the massive surge of water went up that river, made it flow backwards. And it went up on the land, 10 and a half meters high, it's pretty damn high, and it basically put a blanket of mud on top of the paleo ground mm -hmm. surface of that river point bar. It covered up whatever was there. And one of the things that was there is a bunch of dinosaur footprints in the ground. And now we've got those perfectly preserved. So it's like, you know, you've got the Laetoli footprints, the hominids in Africa, and you've got, you know, Pompeii and other places. Uh, this is a similar situation where you peel back the surge deposit and you've got, there's a hadrosaur footprint, there's a theropod footprint, there's a ceratopsin, there's an ornithomimon. And the hat, that were, I want to say hatchling, but, um, you know, the, the um, probably fledgling uh, dinosaurs that were there were very small. You, you're talking about a hadrosaur footprint that's the diameter of a golf ball. No. And that would have been uh, from that year's hatching. That's the last dinosaur hatching of the Cretaceous. And I want to find more of that stuff because that tells you a picture. You know that that animal stepped there at that moment. Right. And you can sort of, it's like almost like you're there. I want to see more of that. Yeah, it's really like painting a picture of exactly what it was like. Yeah. And what do I want? More. <laughs> more Everything. <of> <laughs> Everything. More. And, and more collaboration. Yeah. The teams, I always like to tell people that uh, the, the people that you meet along the way and the teams you get to collaborate with along the way are just as important to us as the discoveries themselves, the scientific discoveries, because those are things that will last a lifetime and lead to further work. Mm -hmm. Every single year, I've been working there for the past 10 years, mm -hmm. and almost every single year, there have been teams from other universities coming out there doing their work. It's been trespassed on a few times too. Right. There have been poachers that trophy hunted out there, yeah. which is a big no-no, it's very bad. Um, but uh, it's, it's not a secret site. Uh, this is uh, being worked on just as any other research site would be, American Museum, Carnegie, all of those. And it is, uh, it is proving to be an amazing um, platform to gather data on the Cretaceous world. So it's essentially not being worked any differently than any other site. That's amazing. Uh, standard operational procedures. And um, it is fenced off, thank goodness. We don't want cows stepping on the fossils. Right. But uh, no, we, you know, as an opportunity to bring students out there and budding paleontologists, interns, and other researchers, it is a phenomenal opportunity. So, 
Um, we wanted to uh, not mention it in any you know media type sense before right. the first paper was put out because here we're working for many many years on a project and we did not want to put out public announcements about this uh, you know before the paper was out. So during the initial phases, absolutely, we just we did not speak publicly. It wasn't a secret, but we just chose not to speak about right. it because we we're still working on it. And I stand by that decision because my team was able to then take a longer amount of time to really piece the story together and not prematurely put out a paper. You know, unfortunately, there was one media piece that uh, uh, was put out before our paper, which had nothing to do with us. We were horrified when that happened. Uh, we had nothing to do with that. They chose to do that and, and kind of dishonor an agreement. So that was a shame. But um, the actual study took that long because we wanted to make sure that our I's were dotted, our T's were crossed, and we had all the data lined up. Right. And now it's open season on it. We, we're out there all the time. And could you tell me a little bit about, because I think this is something, I think that most people who learn about this world of, uh, of paleontology and people who are actually in action doing field work, I think there's this sort of romanticized image that's been created partly by Jurassic Park that you're just sort of out there very easily just like brushing things off of uh, uh, dirt off of bones and everything's very easy and sort of uh, cinematified, you know, from, from the whole experience that we've seen in movies and media. But from what I saw, at least in the documentary, from what I know, you're out there in the elements, you're dealing with wind, rain, mud, dirt, uh, wild animals, you know, there's, there's a, a million and a half things that you need to think about. And then I remember even at one point in the documentary, I think it rained on one of the fossils, right? On a, on a footprint of a theropod. And, uh, you almost get, got ruined. Almost got ruined. So can you tell me a little bit about the stresses, the anxieties of, uh, of dealing with being out there on the dig in the field? Like I said before, this is not something where you're comfortable all the time. Right. And there's a lot of hurry up and wait. And there's a lot of uncomfortable um, conditions to work in. So there was a year that we were snowed out in June. A snowstorm in June out there, where it got wow. in the teens. Another year it was 122 in the shade. You get wind. Uh, there are 85 mile an hour gusts that occur out there. And then you get the biting insects. You get the flies and the mosquitoes and everything. And then rattlesnakes. Uh, there was one year that the prairie fires came in, sandstorms. So you get all that stuff happening. Um, and we're out there trying to do science. We've got all these delicate fossils in the ground, trying to preserve them. They're so important for the fossil record, for the scientific documentation. And then we've got all this weather conditioning and <laughs> animals and everything else. So it's, it's like, <laughs> how are you going to do this? You've got to have a lot of resolve in order to work in that kind of environment. And we're there because we want to do it. And you've got to be stubborn. I don't know, maybe that's the Scottish side. I mean, I'm half Scottish. I think, I think, <laughs> I think that's what really does it. But, but really, you've got to be prepared for it. So when I bring interns out sometimes, sometimes they're not prepared. For that, they're like, well, I thought we were just going to be, you know, dusting Clean off enough, the fossil. Yeah. You know, we, I've seen this. I mean, no, 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 no. First, pain, discomfort. You've got, to, you've got, uh, you know, boredom sometimes right. because you've got a whole layer you've got to go through before you get to the productive layer of, of fossils, and then that takes forever to get through because you're documenting every single, uh, you know, layer above it. So it's a lot of work, a lot of work, but it is so worth it, and. You, know, you see on TV, you know, you see, oh, we're working on Triceratops skin. We're really excited about it. Well, what you don't realize is to get that one shot, they had already used up probably eight or nine hours of film of nothing. Right. And they just had us, you know, stubbing our toes and bleeding on the outcrop and all sorts of other things that happened. And then for that one moment that we didn't even expect to happen, like, oh, wow, we've got this. It's incredible. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's yeah. not like the movies. Yeah. yeah, not at all. And you guys were shooting for months, I'm assuming, right? Like making this uh, documentary happening? A long time. Yeah. yeah, we were shooting for a long time. And you, you don't even notice it happening after a while. We just went along our daily activities. And <laughs> just our the thing. camera's yeah. like hovering over you? Yeah, I, I bumped into them a few times by accident. Cause like, oh, oh, yeah, they're still there. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. <laughs> but they're, they're wonderful, wonderful people. Yeah. And, and they really respected uh, the, the site and what we were doing because, you know, it, it's an active research site. You can't step certain areas. You've got to be careful with certain stuff. And, and they, were, they were wonderful people. So I want to get into something that's. it was really important to me when I found this about you. Go for uh, it. Because Rudy um, actually told me about this. But you are the person who discovered the Dakota Raptor. Yes. yes. And, you, and you named it as well? I named it, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Dakota Raptor came from a different site. It's not from Tannis. Okay. So it's from South Dakota. And uh, my team uh, discovered that a long time ago and uh, we named it in a scientific publication back in 2015. 
Yeah, so when I, when I was a kid growing up with the image of the Velociraptor in Jurassic Park, and then discovering what a Velociraptor actually was, there was definitely a sense of disappointment as a kid. You're like, oh, wow, that's like what it really was, and then what it was on the movie screen, totally different. But the Dakota Raptor, I remember when first finding out about it, it must have been like 10 or 12. Uh, and knowing that there was such a large theropod like that out there, uh, it's, it's, it's so cool. Like a large raptor like that is, is amazing. So can you tell me a little bit about the discovery? Like what, how, how that happened, where you found it? Well, the, the formal discovery of Dakota Raptor happened in South Dakota at a, a research site I was working on for my master's back at University of Kansas. And before we actually discovered that specimen, people had been finding bits and pieces of it for years. There are so many collections out there that have either teeth or isolated bones in that drawer that everyone has that says, unidentified theropod bones. Right. And then you always have that drawer in a collection and, and that's where those bones usually are. But what we eventually did is found a jumbled up disarticulated partial skeleton of Dakota Raptor and it contained bones of uh, the, the, the rear and front limbs and, and, uh, and the slashing claw, the killing claw of the animal. And uh, that was, um, you know, that was our indication that, wow, this, this actually was a giant dromaeosaur and it did get quite, quite large. Right. And the cool thing about that is the ulna, the forearm bone, had a row of bumps that shows you where the feathers plugged in. Right. And basically that shows you that it would have had long feathers uh, on the forearms. And we know that raptors had feathers, but you don't always know if they have long ones on their, on their uh, wings. They don't fly with them, but still are considered wings. Dakota raptor had those. And it's the largest raptor we're aware of that had confirmed large feathers on the wings. But um, the process of uh, working on and prepping Dakota raptor was, uh, you know, it took a while. We had to you know, document all the, uh, all the elements. I mean, even then, because it was found uh, right next to a, a large softshell turtle, one bone ended up getting uh, misconstrued as belonging to the rest of the holotype. From the turtle. Yeah, yeah, one <laughs> bone. And, uh, wow. and that happens in science. Uh, Utah raptor, you know, Utah raptor actually had a bone from a herbivorous dinosaur originally included with the description. Wow. Uh, Lucy, the uh, early hominid, had a bone from a, uh, a, a big cat mm -hmm. included in the skeleton. So it happens, and science uh, corrects itself. Luckily enough, the one uh, bone in Dakota raptor that uh, was uh, misidentified was, it, it had basically nothing to do with the diagnosis of the animal, so it really didn't impact anything, and it was brought to our attention, we immediately corrected it. Um, and that's the way science works. I'm actually glad that happened, because I use it as an example in all of my public engagements with uh, schools and students and everything else. In all the classes that I teach at the mm -hmm. university, I always use that as an example. This is how science works. Take example from that. But uh, all the other bones have given us such a, an idea about how the large raptors are. Because you look at Utah raptor, basically the same size as Dakota raptor. Mm -hmm. Really stocky, robust bones. And that is a beefy tank of a raptor. And Dakota raptor is very long, wiry, agile, and has proportions similar to Deinonychus. So same size, totally different lifestyles. Totally different ways that they would interact with the ecology. And that's fascinating to me. And, and finding and making that discovery, finding out about it, the, the process of bringing that out to the public, what, what was that like for you? Anytime that that is done, it, it's an amazing experience because these animals were incredible. They were an important part of their ecologies and they deserve to be known by science and by people. You know, they, don't, they shouldn't be secrets for all of time. It's our job as scientists to bring them to life and to bring them back to life in a certain way. To reconstruct them. So every time a Dakota raptor or, or some other species is brought to light, that animal is sort of living again because now we know about it and we can learn from it. It's just a, it's like a, a rebirth of the animal. It's cool. Yeah, that's so amazing. It's like you get to announce its, uh, its existence to the world. Like, hey, this animal existed. You know, truth be told, the, the nerdy, shy, introvert scientist in me, I hide it very well, but I am very shy and introverted and nerdy. So I, I usually shy away from the limelight like that, mm -hmm. so I was kind of terrified. Oh God, I gotta be up there on stage talking about this thing. We gotta announce this. Can I just do it like, you know, over Zoom or something? <laughs> Can I just make a tweet? But, <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, so I got anxiety over that, but uh, it, it is a cool experience. And then the thing that really got me is then when the kids start coming up asking questions about it, it doesn't matter if they like dinosaurs or not, they're asking questions and it's getting them used to asking questions. I don't care if they become a lawyer or a doctor or, or anything else. They could be a, a contractor building houses one day, but they're asking questions, and that gets them on track to learning. 
So this is sort of a, a gateway to getting them into critical thinking. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, that's great. So this is sort of like a situation that brings on that, that other kind of collateral benefit. And I like it. That's amazing. And so, I mean, we're coming to the end of the interview, but I was, I was curious to see, for people who might be discovering you through this, um, who, who just learned about this, just learned about tennis, what is sort of up next with you, for, without giving us too many details, you know, because there's certain things I know you can't talk about, but like, what is up next for you? Like, what's, what's on the plane right now? Well, um, we just did a, a, a massive uh, event over at the Goddard Space Center at NASA. So we had a, an amazing work session there with the people uh, at Goddard and uh, a presentation of the latest work and the top minds of NASA were there discussing these projects. And we've got multiple collaborations in the works with the people at NASA because it, it could not have gone better. I cannot say enough about the space program here. Mm -hmm. After seeing that and talking with them, I'm so over the moon about those collaborations. So basically, uh, the group at NASA, our, our, our research group, and several others from Europe are going to be working on different aspects of the Tana story. The animals, the plants, and the asteroid ejecta. Uh, the pterosaur embryo uh, study is going to be coming out this year, as well as some papers on the uh, ejecta. So we've got some interesting stuff to do with that, which I can't talk about much. We were working on it at NASA, though, so mm -hmm. they'll be releasing some of that soon. And uh, we've actually got some more uh, raptor-related stuff to work on. We'll be doing more paleo. <laughs> Amazing. That's what we want to know. We'll be doing way more paleo. <laughs> That's the best, man. You just do as much paleo as you can. 2022 is the year That's of it. paleo. That's it. So to end off the interview, I got a goofy question for you. It's just... I got a goofy answer for it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Will you be watching Jurassic World Dominion when it comes out this summer? If what, you even know that it exists. What's Jurassic World Dominion? It's no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm <laughs> joking. Yes, I'll be watching Jurassic World Dominion. In fact, I will probably go to the movie theater covered in dirt and filth because <laughs> I will be on expedition at that point. Amazing. So I will have to drive three hours to the theater and I'm not changing. I'm going to wear my field gear. So I'm going to show up there straight from the dig site and I'm going to show up and watch that damn movie <laughs> and I'm going to enjoy it. That's amazing. And there's, no way, there's no better way to build up hype, I feel like, when you're out there in the elements digging up these animals than seeing a movie monster restoration of them on the big screen. Exactly. Yeah. Here, you know, we're going to have the whole group there. We're going to be tired and dirty and everything else. And what's the better way to end off the day than, all right, hey, drive three hours. Let's watch the movie. All right, let's go for it. That's what's going to happen. Hell yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, I, I appreciate it so much. Thanks for sitting down with you me. Got talk. Uh, this was amazing. It's so cool to learn your story. And obviously, guys, you can check out his work down below in the description and, of course, his involvement in the Palm Beach Museum of Natural History, which set this whole thing up, which made this whole thing possible. So uh, with that being said, we'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. And that's it for our first episode of A Conversation With. Make sure you subscribe and turn on those notifications so you don't miss a single video from the Dinosaur Channel. As well, become a member on our channel to unlock exclusive perks that only you can have if you become a member. Big thank you again to the Palm Beach Museum of Natural History for even setting up this interview with Robert De Palma. It's actually insane that I even got to talk to him, considering I'm fairly new in the paleo world. I hope that this is the first of many conversations I get to have with awesome paleontologists across the world. If you guys have anybody you would like to hear me have a conversation with, or any topic you would like to hear me talk about, please leave them in the comments down below. Don't forget to leave us a dinosaur-sized thumbs up, and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.